Carl, take it away. Cool, cool. All is well. All right, cool. So we're going to talk about um, CICD for your network, and we're going to have a lot of cat pictures because reasons. Um, so this should be fun, hopefully. Uh, pretty low key, not super professional, right? Uh, I reserve the right to be wrong. I'm going to just start by saying that about some of it or everything, um, but we'll just jump right into it. Uh, so just a high level agenda. Uh, really quick, we're going to do a brief introduction um, about who I am, why I'm talking about this, and then we'll talk about kind of a problem statement. Uh, what are we trying to solve? Like, you know, what what are the challenges that we see in you know, traditional networking? Uh, why why are these problems hard? Right? If they weren't hard, we would just solve them. So what what are the things that are making solving these things actually tough? Uh, hopefully, we're going to have a live demo. So you know, knock on wood. Uh, hopefully, that'll go okay. Mm -hmm. And then we'll kind of talk briefly about the demo environment that we saw. So why would why why would I care about CI/CD? And, and really, even before we we kind of talk about why CI/CD, we'll we'll already you know seen the demo and everything. But uh, we're going to talk briefly about what is CI/CD uh, from a software perspective. And then we'll talk about okay, well that's great. Uh, why as a network person would I care about absolutely any of that? Uh, and then we'll talk kind of a bit of a review or recap about kind of what we saw in the demo. Like what does this look like? And and again. I reserve the right to be wrong about all of this. This is totally just, uh, you know, one example or one way to do it. It's more of a thought exercise than anything, really. Uh, but we'll talk about kind of what we saw, why we kind of picked, or why I kind of picked the tools or platforms or or whatever that I picked. Uh, and then we'll kind of talk about how we can kind of supercharge that. What what can we bolt on to to this kind of uh, workflow or or whatever you want to call it? Uh, what are some possible next steps? Like, how could we make this even more practical or applicable, or fit this into our, you know, your particular environment in a more directly useful way? Uh, and then hopefully we're gonna have time to talk about a little bit of how to actually lab this up yourself. There's a GitHub repo for all of this, which I will show you in the demo. Um, so all of this is gonna be, you know, publicly available. I'm, I think Drew and, and Ethan already have links for everything, so I'm guessing that will be somewhere handy for everybody as well. And then at the end. Uh, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Hopefully, I think I've got this down to enough time for questions. Uh, but obviously, <laughs> if questions come up, uh, I'd rather have them live. So let's just do that. And if we don't get through you know, all the deck, no big deal. So really quick before we kind of start, um, just a, a brief introduction. Um, so that's my cat. His name is Luca. He plays fetch very, very poorly, but he does. So that's exciting. I uh, figured since there's cats on like almost every slide of this, I should at least put him in there. Um, my background is total just recovering router jockey, um, CCIE, service writer and route switch, although I never really did a ton of service writer stuff, but it was a fun little adventure to do anyway. Um, went pretty hard down uh, that route switch rabbit hole after military, big healthcare consulting. Um, and done a little bit of everything, pre-sales, post-sales, training stuff, creating content, all of that kind of you know fun stuff, whatever gets me paid. Uh, and then I, and I, I'm, I'm mentioning all of this only because I think it's relevant because I, I assume um, most of the Pack Pushers audience is probably you know generally normal network folk like myself. So I have no CS background whatsoever at all, um, but I still find all of this stuff useful and interesting. So that's 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 the only reason I'm really talk about that. Um, I kind of accidentally became a Python enthusiast, and now I'm wearing the shirt, so you know it's real, uh, it's official. Um, maybe five or so years ago, I started doing, or in kind of even before that, I started doing a lot of data center stuff with the predominantly Cisco, just because Cisco partners uh, at the time, uh, Fabric Path stuff, and then into VXLAN, uh, which is multicast, and then eVPN. Uh, and then, as you would, working for a Cisco vendor, I ended up doing a lot of Cisco ACI stuff in the, in the dark ages, in the 1.0 days, so that was... It's an exciting adventure all by itself. Um, this is not that. We will not be talking about ACI. <laughs> Unless anybody has questions, then that's fine. Um, and doing ACI was kind of cool because it kind of opened things up for me in a way that I was able to learn about APIs in a, in a really practical way. Right? If you got to go deploy ACI, well, you can tickle the API of ACI, and then, hey, look, things you know, got created. Um, and so it was, it was really, really like tangible and practical for, for my day job, as opposed to kind of just like API, all the things, like you're a network person, you need to know APIs. Uh, but that was just very kind of like thought process stuff, or like uh, a thought exercise, right? And this this was actually kind of real for me, so that was cool. Um, so I started using uh, Postman, uh, which is basically just an API test tool, uh, but it has this cool little bolt-on thing called Runner, where it'll allow you to iterate through a CSV and you know make a bunch of API calls. So I started like actually doing full ACI deployments with that, which was really probably exactly not what it was meant for, uh, but it ended up being a cool way to learn about stuff. Uh, and then I kind of was like, well, you know, this is a this is a really trash idea. <laughs> this is probably not what you know you should be doing. 
Um, and so then I ended up basically recreating that in Python and then I just kind of haven't looked back. And so I've been hope trying to tickle things with Python as often as possible um, all the time now. Um, and then in general, yeah, just trying to automate to work less. Um, also really excited. I'll be joining Kirk Byers here coming up in March um, and doing all the stuff with him uh, for Python for Network Engineering. So hopefully be much more Python in my future. So I'm pretty, pretty excited for that. Joining him is in uh, your, uh, you're moving over to work for Kirk? Yes, sir. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you heard it first here. In fact, All sure. right. <laughs> so yeah, looking forward to that. Um, okay, so what's the problem? So this is going to be a lot of stuff that everybody already knows because it's all stuff that we, whoops, that we have all heard about in one way, shape, uh, or another, one way, uh, one form or another. Um, and, and it's kind of beating the dead horse, but we kind of have to talk about it again just to make sure we're all on, kind of on the same page, right? Um, so manual deployments are not awesome, right? They're not hard. They're not good. So artisanal, handcrafted, snowflake magic, you know, whatever we want to call it. Um, vendor answer tends to be, I have an API, so that solves this problem. Um, and that's obviously just a BS thing, right? Because just having an API doesn't mean that we're, we're, actually, we're automating deployments of anything. We're not wrapping process around anything. It just gives us a, a arguably better way to tickle devices, whether, you know, router switches or, or whatever. Um, but that's not really solving the problem, right? Um, and this isn't just about fat fingers or, or screw ups or, or, you know, things like that. Um, it's about just wrapping process around all of this. Like, how are we doing our, uh, how are we deploying our changes? Um, how are we uh, hopefully validating our changes or, or not validating our changes as, as it were in, in a lot of, a lot of scenarios? Um, generally, a lot of the time, what I see for, for customers is, uh, you know, We'll, we'll have this change process and it'll go to cab uh, or cab will be part of this change process and somebody on cab will say okay what's your test plan and you know you'll say okay well hey, i'm going to ping the things when i'm done and they'll say okay fine but they're probably from some other organization that's not networking and they probably don't care anyway uh, so you're just yeah. kind of ticking boxes and you're not actually holistically validating your network right you might check solar winds and say okay cool is everything working like uh, did anything go red after my change uh, but you're not doing generally holistic validation um, and you're not generally doing uh, you know thorough validation of like well i had this many routes before and i don't now have this many routes plus five or whatever i was supposed to to kind of have right so um, so, so we're, we're going after the challenge of you need to validate that your test that you need to validate that the change that you're about to make isn't going to blow things up and do it in a methodical way that gives you meaningful results as opposed to like you said the test plan that someone goes oh they have a test plan i guess that's good check <laughs> right and, and and not just um validate your change but validate everything like holistically right like it's cool to be like okay well i'm going to do these things and i'm going to test this widget that i you know configured i added a new loop back i'll ping it okay good it's an ospf or something like that uh, but did that cause anything was there like a trickle trickle down effect that no okay now that was actually the router idea of some branch in you know some other time zone and they're not there mm -hmm. and maybe things are still reachable but i have like a weird route flapping thing right and like how do we validate holistically and we're, like generally speaking i don't think we as network folk have done that terribly well um partly because it's process and partly because cab is a crappy process that, that we end up generally having to go through and so it just becomes this painful thing then one more qualifying question for people that are used to modeling their changes in a lab environment what you're doing is uh better different from that in what way um so the i think the idea would be that every change you do and so this kind of goes to like a test driven development mentality from from like the software side of things where um, you might, in test-driven development, you might write your unit test before you actually write the code, right? So I want to test that when I write this function, for example, you know, we'll just use the total super simple function of multiplication, right? So I might write a unit test that says, hey, given A or one and two, or we'll say two and three, I should assert that the result of that function when past those two arguments is going to be six, right? So every time you do a change, you write a test, right? And then now is every time that I go and I make a change, I run my entire suite of tests. So it's not just great, I, I built it in a lab and I tested the thing that I was going to do. It's great, I built it in the lab, I tested the thing I'm going to do, and then I added that to the test suite as a whole. And every single change I make, I run the entire test suite. Does that make sense? 
I'm like on yeah, my pop up uh, on cold medicine, so it's it's super exciting. You know me both, buddy. I'm on the downside, but I'm on cold medicine right now. Cold medicine, cool. buddies. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That no, that makes good sense, and I think it was just really important to highlight what we're talking about here is pretty different from oh, I threw some stuff in the lab and it worked, so I'm good. You, you we're just right. talking about a testing methodology that's got a robust set of tests for every time you run a change. Yeah, that, uh, and, and it's and it's also like result. it's testing the not truthiness of things too, right? So like. If I add a loop, uh, add a route statement to OSPF or something, did I just accidentally advertise something from PCI into something that was, you know, like dorms or something where it's like anybody? And that's a, you know, contrived example. But like, am I testing things that should not work as well, right? Like, I shouldn't be able to get to PCI from student network or from, you know, I shouldn't be able to get to any HIPAA things from my guest wireless or something like that, right? So not just testing all of the things are pinging as they should, but also testing like is your security working is all are all of these things working this is obviously like a really like kind of uh high and mighty place to try to get to right this is not like a thing that we're going to get to overnight or anything by any stretch but wouldn't it be kind of swell if we could test all of the things all of the time i guess is what i'm what i'm trying to say and it's and it's a hard problem um so hopefully by wrapping process around all of this um we can hopefully kind of push push ahead and and get better at that i guess um, so, so kind of next thing. So consistency is hard. Um, one of my pet peeves is that automation is not about speed. It's about consistency. Um, and speed happens to be a happy little accident of automating a thing. Um, but the, the consistency is the important part to me, right? So if we generate our configs in a consistent fashion, if we deploy them in a consistent fashion, if we test them in a consistent fashion, uh, if we roll back, if we need to in a consistent fashion, um, that's hard to do. So that's a problem right now. But if we can be consistent about each of those things. We can obviously, there's some pretty obvious like benefits or gains to be, to be had um, from, you know, just all of that. Well, I'm really not so so good at the uh, scrolling on my notes page today, apparently. Um, anyway, and then uh, collaboration and transparency is lacking. So this I think is kind of a universal truth in networking, I guess I'll say. Um, it's just, it, this is a, you know, we, we kind of in the AMA, it's just like, oh, it's layer eight problem. And that's totally true, right? And that the vast majority of the problems that we have um, are layer eight problems. Um, and, it, and part of that is how do we get everybody on the same kind of page? How do we get everybody on an even playing field? And, you know, the, it's it's hard to do. So this this entire deck and this kind of like idea or this process isn't necessarily about technology. Sure, we're we're going to talk about like Jenkins and Ansible and whatever, and that's fine. Um, but it's about how do we wrap all of this stuff into process um, in a, so that we can do things in a consistent fashion, right? And this is hopefully going to kind of have the side effect of eliminating at least some of the layer eight problems and getting everybody singing from the same sheet of music. Um, everybody's going to be able to be uh, aware of all of the changes that are happening because of maybe you know Slack integration or or something like that, um, but just layer eight just tends to be a problem. So I, I won't kind of berate you know beat on that because I think everybody can kind of probably agree with that. Um, okay, so I think hopefully everybody agrees more or less on the, the problem statements. Um, so why is it hard to actually get around any of these things or, or to kind of push through and, and kind of make progress in all of these? Um, the first one, too much noise. I think this is totally true in everything about IT, but there's just a lot going on um, everywhere, right? Like, why would anybody care about Ansible when there's 50 gajillion other tools out there? Um, and, you know, they're probably, I know for me, I tend to do kind of what's in front of my face, right? If I've got this problem, I'm going to try to find a tool to do that thing, but, uh, you know, can't see the forest through the trees sometimes, right? Just because there's so much stuff happening in IT, right? So it's hard to filter kind of what you, what what is valuable to you, right? Um, and, and kind of part of that is follow the money, right? So um, vendors are obviously incented to sell stuff, right? So following the money can kind of help kind of clear some of the noise. So uh, unprompted plug for for network break. This is <laughs> um, it's a great way to like actually kind of just see what's happening and and you know all the, hear the, all the financials and, and Drew and, and and Greg can do all the hard work of figuring all that out for us, um, but um, and this is like, I don't really have good sources for any of these things. So these are all just feels that I'm um, totally, totally okay with being wrong about. But some of my feels is that um, hyperscale and ISPs tend to outspend or at least out um, talk about um, networking uh, as compared to enterprises, right? And so 
those folks, obviously there's some low com lowest common denominators, a network is a network is a network, but some of these folks have different kind of requirements or needs or, or whatever from your traditional enterprise customer. Um, so in ISP, for example, I think there's probably a, a much higher drive toward vendor independence or vendor neutrality. Um, you know, I think Comcast uh, at least has historically done this where they have different regions of Comcast or different vendors and they do that. That way they can kind of pit the vendors against each other, uh, you know, race to zero, you know, so so they can you know get the best discount or whatever from each of the vendors and kind of keep everybody in check. Right. So there's a huge push from what I can tell um, for the kind of Yang model thing there. Right. Because now if we go I triple E ITF or open config you know, vendor neutral Yang models, you can say, okay, well, I don't really care what the hardware is. I just care that this is what my, you know, region looks like or whatever. Uh, and then whoever's going to give me the best price, as long as they support this, you know, standard thing, right? I, I triple E, ITF, whatever thing, then I don't necessarily have to care. And I could just beat them up. I can, you know, mix and match and, and do whatever, right? Um, I, I, so I like the theory of that. As long as your network is simple enough to be able to be modeled in that standardized way, then that's a, that's a great story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hard problem for sure. But I mean, I, I think I think we can probably all agree that vendors or ISPs in particular are just trying to beat the vendors in, into submission so that they can, you know, save money. So I think, you know, kind of makes sense that I, then that's seems like, you know, a lot of the NetConf Yang stuff is being spearheaded from that um, yeah. ISP world, m less so than hyperscale, although, I, you know, subject to being proven completely wrong about that. But in general, I from from my perspective you know my kind of myopic carl viewpoint on things is that hyperscale from what i see is looking more toward kind of disaggregation and or kind of better ways to actually manage devices right so you kind of the flat config file config file model like cumulus or disaggregation with like running sonic on nexus 9ks or something like that um, and that gives them better ways because they have you know all of these special things that they want to do and they want to be able to configure it in a way that makes the most sense for them right um so I guess then the the kind of following the money thing, are these things, are these pushes where enterprises want to be? And I think that the answer is maybe or maybe not. <laughs> I think certainly some of it's cool. Some of it is maybe less so. I think um, enterprises tend to um, want more package solutions. I think there's, a, you know, still a, a I don't want to say fear. It's probably the wrong word, but some, some, resistance to, to maybe going toward a more open source model. Um, I think if you look at ISPs in hyperscale, those are people that are weaponizing their networks, right? That's how they make money. Um, and so the mentality and the investment into to network is a little bit different or, you know, more, it's more of a focus from the business perspective than a traditional enterprise. You know, you work at a hospital, you know, they're not generally going to be like, oh yeah, this, you know, this sweet campus, switch is going to make us a bunch of money, even though obviously they, they do, but there's just a different kind of focus there. Um, and so, you know, because of that lack of focus, I think that there tends to be uh, less big focused network teams at traditional enterprises as opposed to kind of ISP hyperscale. And so all of this kind of money trickling down, it just makes it hard for enterprises, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so then, uh, and, and I guess before, um, yeah, anyway, um, for the vendor software disparity stuff. So I think there's a lot of confusion here, right? So, uh, even if you're a, a homogenous enterprise, you, you know, all Cisco, all Arista, whatever, you probably still have different hardware or software disparity, right? Uh, I might have 2960s in my campus, uh, and I might not, uh, or campus A and campus B might have new CAT 9Ks or something. So there's going to be difference in what's supported from a software perspective. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times people aren't homogenous, right? It's a heterogeneous network, so there's going to be different interfaces to different, you know, devices and how do I configure things and obviously all of this is just kind of making things harder for us to, to kind of standardize and automate against um, and then you know just kind of sticking to the vendor thing right so Juniper seems to have kind of jumped pretty fully on the netconf bandwagon probably because lots of ISP stuff that would make sense to me um, Greg's favorite rant about Cisco having 90 gajillion operating systems you know some truth there right so uh, XEXR and XOS has NetConf at least support at least to some extent. And then you've also got things like ACI, um, DNA Center, whatever, which is more kind of RESTful um, APIs type stuff. Um, I think Arista has a C++ SDK, which I can only assume is for, for 
HFT of some sort. Um, so I guess the, the net net is this is hard because if you have all of these different vendors or even a single vendor with different operating systems, how do you automate against that and how do you kind of you know, get progress there? So Carl, we don't want you to run yourself out of time. So, uh, so, 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 hurry so up. show it to it. me, baby. Noted, noted. All right, <laughs> um, layer eight. Okay, uh, just real quick. Um, so layer eight stuff, I think we can all agree. Um, lots of problems. Um, just from a political perspective, I think one of the things about um, the layer eight thing is that there's a perception that the network is slow. Um, so obviously if the network's slow, it's hard to kind of get any momentum. And then obviously in terms of like politics, you you might have organiz organizations or groups within your organization that have, um, you know, skill set in Ansible or Python or Puppet or something, but you might not be able to kind of lean on that uh, expertise in house just because of the kind of politics. So, net net, all of this is hard. Belaboring the point, you get it. Okay, so let's see what we got going on. So just real quickly here. Let's... Um, so we have this little demo environment, um, and this is going to be available for everybody here on this. Um, this repo here, if I can get that out of the way. Um, doo -doo -doo. So basically what this is, is a Vagrant environment that has uh, a Nexus 9000V and Arista VEOS box, and then also an Ubuntu server running Jenkins. Uh, and basically Jenkins is going to point to this repository and um, the Jenkins host already has a Docker uh, container image already built on it. And so basically what's gonna happen is when we trigger builds from Jenkins, uh, and that could be done via webhooks or whatever, but for now it's just going to be a manual kind of trigger the build. Uh, this repository is going to get cloned into the the Docker container, and Jenkins file is basically going to define what Jenkins should do, right? So the Jenkins file is kind of going to be the process, or is going to be what wraps this all of these like kind of individual playbooks and scripts up uh, into a process and deploys all of this stuff. Uh, so just real quickly, uh, earlier before the demo, I just vagrant up uh, in my environment and, I, and all my stuff kind of came up and I, I ran the build and so then if we go here we can go and basically look at all of the output from this the build that got triggered uh, so basically what we can see here um, briefly is that Jenkins uh, upon triggering the build fires up this my network as code docker container uh, inside this container it's going to clone this repository and then basically we run through um, this pipeline file that basically is going to define all of the steps that Jenkins needs to take. Now, the so idea is that we're doing quick, clone the repository. You said that for people that don't know Git at all, you're just taking a copy from that repository you've got up in GitHub, bringing it down locally. So now you're working off a local copy of all that data, correct? Yep, exactly, exactly. And then what, what's cool about this is that uh, all you have to do in Jenkins is point it to this repository and then and basically say, hey, for this build, you need to look into this repository and there'll be a Jenkins file. And this is the kind of common convention thing with Jenkins. Yep. And so it'll clone this repository, look at this file and say, oh, these are the steps that I need to run. So basically, hey, use this container, um, check out SCM, so check out source control manager or management, which is basically say, hey, clone this repo. Uh, and then as we're gonna, we're gonna kind of move ahead and talk about CICD stuff, but basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna run all of our unit testing stuff, right? So CI is continuous integration. So this is how do I test all my code as it's happening? So in networking, you know, that might take a couple different forms, but for now we're just gonna run syntax checks against our play, all of the playbooks that we need to make sure that, hey, they're all looking good. Um, you know, nothing's gonna be broken. That way when we get to, if we you know generate configs and that works and we back up configs and that works and we deploy configs and that works and then our validate playbook is broken, um, you know, that would be a bad day, right? So we wanna check that, mm. the, they're all valid before we go anywhere. Um, we can run a really simple hokey Python script that I wrote to just basically validate user inputs. Um, and so this is basically validating the inputs that I'm putting into the variable files that Ansible is pulling from. And so I'm validating some really hokey stuff like, hey, that's a valid IP address. Um, it's a valid VLAN ID, right? 4097 is not a valid VLAN ID. Um, and this is, again, kind of for purposes of a demo, kind of a hokey way to do it, but that's okay. And then we basically using Jinja, um, in Ansible, we generate configurations files from templates. Uh, then we connect to our devices and we back up those configurations. Um, that way, if something goes wrong, we can you know, safely roll back to wherever we were at. 
then we go and we deploy our configurations. And then finally, we, we validate our co configurations. And this is not what I would recommend doing in production, uh, but this is a quick way to do it. So we basically just sleep for a minute to let BGP OSPF come up, all that's good. Uh, and so then we run a validate playbook. I mean, this is interesting because what, what, what really has happened here is you've taken what a human being does, what a network engineer does, and it's now been automated and it's been put in a a way that is very replicable. You're going to do it the same way every time, whereas you as a human exactly. might, depending on how much cold medicine you're on, uh, miss a step. <laughs> you know, yeah. this script that you've written is never going to miss a step. And so you once you've got this built in a way that it's testing all the things that you want to be testing for your environment, you will have a high degree of confidence that... Uh, the change that you're putting through is going to work or is not going to work if the testing fails, if things don't work out or validate the way exactly. you need. Exactly. Yeah. So this is really kind of wrapping a bunch of things up, right? This is kind of infrastructure as code. And now I'm administering my network from Ansible config files. This is CICD, right? Wrapping all of this up in process from Jenkins. This is um, consistency, which I guess is just kind of all of that because we're we're building and deploying from a container. So our container image is obviously the same. So every time the container starts, um, and then exactly what you said, right? We're wrapping the stuff that we as humans would do in process that is, you know, automatable, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so this is basically what happens. So we, we run our syntax checks. Great, life is good. If any of these things fail, the build fails, right? And we'll we'll see what happened in the log here, um, in the in the Jenkins log. Um, we validate some user input. So we just run this hokey Python script to test, you know, IPs and, and whatever. Um, we back up all of our stuff. So in this case, we're backing up the configurations and it, it just gets backed up to the container. The container gets nuked at the end of the build anyway. But so in real life, you know, you could copy these off to an S3 bucket or, you know, do whatever makes sense. Uh, and then off we go and we do deployment. We actually go and use um, Napalm Ansible to actually go and replace the configurations. So um, one of the things that we haven't really talked about is kind of merge versus replace and atomic commits and all this other stuff, which is probably way more than we have time for. Um, but basically, um, we can just wholesale replace the configurations on these two devices. Uh, that way, you know, if there was a description on loopback, whatever, and I wanted to delete that description, you know, as a human, you would log into the device and say, you know, no description or set the new description. Um, but if we do a merge operation and we're not knowing out the, the description and the merge, then we're going to miss that. So instead of dealing with that and kind of trying to figure out the state of these devices, we're just going to wholesale replace configurations uh, using Napalm. And so Napalm gives us a consistent way to do that across multiple vendors. Um, Nexus. Napalm being a, a library that is uh, available for Python that abstracts exactly. away a, a whole bunch of different devices, as you say, gives you a common interface to several different network device types. Yep, exactly, exactly. And so then in our case, we're actually using the Napalm Ansible module. So it's basically just kind of a yep. shim between, you know, pure Python, Napalm and, and Ansible. Um, and we're kind of picking on Ansible just because it's a low kind of barrier to entry. Um, and then basically what's happening, um, kind of the, the testing part. So we'll talk more about this in a minute, but the testing part is obviously great. And we want to test our syntax and, and all of that kind of stuff, validate inputs and all of that at the front end. But then from a validation, and, and writing these unit tests that test every single bit of our functionality. Uh, I wrote some really hokey Ansible playbooks that I don't necessarily recommend you use <laughs> or even use uh, Ansible to do this. Um, but basically we check to, hey, is the peer on this interface up? Is the peer on this interface up? Is the BGP yeah. peer up? Do I, can I ping this thing, right? So these, are, you know, this, this repo is public so everybody can go and, and check it out. Um, but basically these are just playbooks that go and test each and every single one of these things that I wanna do. So if I wanted to add a loopback interface, um, uh, package pushers VDC, there we go. Uh, if I wanted to add a loopback interface, I could go to the, to the host variables file and this is common Ansible syntax if you're unfamiliar. And I could basically say, hey, add a loopback interface right here. Um, some of this is kind of some some you know, keys and values that for the templates that I created that are you know kind of one-off. But basically, what I could do is I can add a you know loop back here, and then I would want to go ahead and I would want to write a test to validate that that is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so in this case, I can say, well, this is my test. The BGP peer is up, and I can just run show IP BGP neighbors. And if I you know don't see established in the output, then I know that this didn't work, right? Um, or I can just run a simple ping that says, hey, yeah, that's working from, you know, the, the Docker container or from, you know, one of these devices. 
Yeah, you're using napalm here, and so you're, in, in some regard, you're using some screen scraping where you are having to actually parse out strings to get a result as opposed to an API that's going to give you structured data? Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so cold medicine is kicking in. Hang in there, buddy. Too much cold medicine. I'm, I'm doing like a half an hour. No, or however long. Um, so yeah, so the, the actual deploy configurations is using the API for both of these devices. Um, so NX API or EAPI. Um, and we're actually going to do the, the config replaces in that okay. way. Um, from the actual validation playbooks, um, a little bit of a, a mixed bag. Um, NXOS command, I believe we're using the API. Uh, but the API is still not necessarily, you know, pull this thing, give me a bunch of structured data back. It, it might just be... Um, you know, run this command and here's the output in standard out. Um, so you can see okay. in this example from standard out, yeah. give me these things. So yeah, so it's not ideal. So we're running a command, we're getting the JSON output, but it's it's not, you know, I guess full blown API, if you will. Uh, I, I think as, as you were kind of thinking. So um, just in the interest of time, I won't I won't run through and, and update this, but basically if if you want to um, to do this, um, I'll, we'll talk about that and we'll get to that in the deck. Uh, but, but, uh, There's some context here. Uh, you know, as you're looking at everything you just showed us there with that, it looks like I would be running that against a live environment in real life. Or... Yeah, so, yeah, so it, it depends. Um, it, obviously, for the demo, it's just the, the two boxes in Vagrant um, that are up. Um, so you might model a vagrant environment to, to emulate your thing. You might do this against, uh, you might have a multi-stage kind of pipeline that's going to validate this against something like Viral or Unit Lab or GNS3 before it, and, and then test it there. And if all of that goes well, uh, then you might go and have the, uh, like a gated uh, thing in Jenkins that says, okay, this is a, the results from deploying this to dev, you know, big red button, go ahead and deploy it to prod. Uh, or you might be, you know, deploying this to prod and, and running all of your changes through this um, kind of pipeline. I, I, obviously, that's going to depend on hugely on okay. organization and kind of where you're the at. Point being, you can use it against your lab environment. You can use it against a, a test environment, and you can also use it against a live environment, all absolutely. your prod environment, all depending. Yeah, absolutely. And and one way to kind of maybe do that in a really simple way would be you might just have different inventory files for different environments. So you might have a, a GNS3 lab or a viral lab or whatever, and you would have, you know. Ansible inventory file for lab, and then you have a you know another inventory file for prod or something like that. Um, so it could be the same playbooks, it could be the same pipeline, it can be a lot of you know similar stuff. So you don't have to do a bunch of rework. Um, okay, so what are we even talking about with CI/CD? Um, so that was you know kind of whirlwind demo, um, cold medicine, all that good stuff. Um, but CICD is continuous integration, continuous delivery, and, and possibly also continuous deployment. And so this is really a software kind of development methodology. Um, again, this is all process. It's not necessarily a tool or technology or anything like that. Um, but the net net is that continuous integration is its entire purpose in life is to identify issues as early as possible. So in software, that's you know identify bugs, right? So continuous integration tests might be something like compile your code, right? If you're running uh, writing in a compiled language and your code doesn't compile, then you know obviously you're not going to get very far. Uh, we might also do some linting or formatting. We might run unit tests or integration tests to make sure that you know all of these things are functioning as you know desired or expected or hoped. Um, and then at the end of this would be at the end of this CI process, we would hopefully have an artifact that can be delivered somewhere, and that's you know maybe compiled code or a new Docker image or something like that. Uh, at that point, we could move to the CD portion, right? Continuous delivery, and we could take that artifact, whatever that was, and deploy it somewhere useful. So maybe it's taking that uh, compiled code and, and putting that binary in an S3 bucket or artifactory or something like that. Um, and then continuous deployment is actually okay. Great, we're going to go and, and deploy that. So maybe that's copy, you know, some WAR file to a server and restart Apache, or maybe it's using Kates to schedule, you know, roll out new container, um, you know, containers in your in your environment with the new based on the new container image or something like that. So why would we care about any of that from a, a networking perspective? Um, well, I think for the most part, just a, at a process layer, I think this stuff makes a lot of sense. Um, because it doesn't the C the whole idea of CI/CD isn't necessarily about software. Uh, certainly, it's applied to software, but it's just process, and so we could apply that process to kind of whatever we want, and we can get some pretty obvious benefits. 
um, we could reduce human interaction. Uh, we're not going to be able to necessarily eliminate human interaction, of course, because we're still building and designing networks and we need to, you know, know what IP address is going on something. But we can eliminate the amount of touch points, right? So in the example of this demo, if I wanted to add a loopback, I simply go to a variable file and I say loopback 10, here's the IP address. So I didn't actually log into a device, right? And then in this case, there's a Python script that every field that basically is an IP address or says IP for the, the key uh, is going to be validated to make sure that it's a valid IP address. Everything that says VLAN is going to be valid to, validated to make sure it's a valid VLAN. So certainly we can use that to kind of wrap process around this and, and kind of have some checks so that we're you know not fat fingering on live boxes. Um, another one that I think is really valuable, but I'm, I'm always hesitant to talk about is documentation. And so I kind of say documentation-ish because the cool thing about all of this and this kind of infrastructure as code mentality is that we're moving toward putting our infrastructure in code. And when it's infrastructure as code, that means it's versionable. We can put it in a version control thing like GitHub or GitLab or whatever. And now we have uh, a history of everything that happened to this you know, file, whatever it is, variable file or Ansible playbook. Um, we have ways that we can collaborate on all of this. Hopefully our Ansible playbooks are, you know, more verbose or more clear than just, you know, whatever's in my, you know, cold riddled head in the corner. Um, so hopefully we're you know, putting things on paper. It's obviously not self-documenting. Um, I think that would be a stretch to say, but as we start putting things into, you know, text, it becomes easier to um, train people up on it and, and give us kind of a, a common working ground. Um, shortened feedback loops. This is really the whole entire point of CI um, is to catch things as early as possible, right? Um, so from a networking perspective, what does that mean? Um, this is going to be hugely dependent on how you actually go and deploy this uh, in your environment or, uh, or you know, how you kind of do CI or CD or actually deploy these things in your network. Um, so one thing that we could do would be formatting and linting. So just like in software, right, if we're writing Ansible uh, playbooks or we're writing Python scripts to actually go out and tickle our network, uh, we could actually run linting checks against those to just make sure that they're in a, in a nice format that meets our, you know, company company guidelines. Um, so literally just exactly like software. Um, we might do some checking for things like uh, route map names, ACL names, prefix list names, blah, 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 to make sure that the variables that we're inputting meet our company standard. That way, uh, you know, uh, if everything's consistent, then it's going to be easier to automate against everything. So we might be able to do that. Um, just like in this kind of hokey example, we might have a script or some way to validate user inputs for IPs and VLANs to make sure, you know, 4097, again, is not a valid VLAN. Um, we might have, and that could be something like a unit test for, for networking. <coughs> Excuse me. Ugh. Um, we might also have integration tests. So this is where it could get kind of more interesting. So in software, a unit test is uh, designed to test as small of a chunk of code as possible, right? So in that, I wrote a multiplication function example, um, you know, that takes you know, two arguments and returns the, the result of them multiplied together. The unit test would validate that given two and three, you know, the result is six. But a, an integration test might actually um, test chunks of code that are unit tested basically um, working together, right? So I might have a multiplication and a division and I might run both of those operations to you know, get some end result. And I might write an integration test that says, given these values, uh, run these functions and assert that the ultimate end result is this. So in networking, that could be, my unit test could be validating the IP address or the VLAN or the whatever. And my integration test could be validating that, great, we know that it's a valid IP address but I can go out and query something like a netbox to say, oh, it's a valid IP address um, and it's valid for this device or it's not in use or something like that. Um, yeah, netbox so is an IAM solution. Exactly, exactly. Um, so there's a lot of interesting opportunity there. Um, and then of course, because we're hopefully testing everything, right, um, I can automate rollbacks if any of my, you know, uh, configs failed or, or so didn't work in. Okay, automated rollbacks, right? If something doesn't work, you'd want to roll it back, but does that, so a question came in from uh, Evan, does the CICD framework assume that you've got a separate out-of-band management network because it would be pretty hard to roll back if changes blow up yeah, certainly. Roll connectivity? Certainly. Um, so that's the Jenkins, in, in this case, which is really kind of our CICD tool of choice, is, is really indifferent to all of that, right? So it would be incumbent on us to build 
you know, things in a way that we're able to still get to devices, of course. Um, in the the lab example, you can kind of nuke everything because the management port is hard coded in the in the config files, uh, and obviously we're going to be able to get to it from Vagrant, so that's easy. Um, but no, CI/CD or Jenkins or Ansible or any of this isn't going to kind of save us from ourselves in that. But the net the hope would be that we would be um, operating in this framework that's tested and validated before we kind of take this to production. I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but but the short answer is no. <laughs> Um, but because we can test everything, we can roll back, right? And so hopefully when we, um, unless we nuke our management VRF or whatever, hopefully we really have out-of-band management, uh, and then this is a you know much less of an issue. Um, but assuming we still have access to the devices, we can roll back. Um, we can do a lot more testing too than, than what we've kind of talked about in here. Um, I think we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next page. Um, Time check for you, Carl. You're running up about five minutes left. Okay, cool. Um, and then finally, transparency. Everybody would be able to see kind of what's happening through the logs that we saw in Jenkins. So that's that's cool. Um, CI logs are, are much, much better than human memory. So I only had the one build that I built earlier today, but we would have you know, lots of, uh, we would have a history of every build that ran and we would be able to go and see kind of at a point in time what happened. Hopefully we're integrating this with Slack or you know whatever our, our chat option of, of choice is. Um, that way everybody can kind of see what when builds are happening and why they fail or, or what happened. Um, and basically the net net is hopefully this is all done in the open so that we're kind of getting everybody on the same sheet of music as it were. You, you kind of have to be with this. You can't be a cowboy and run a automated environment successfully. Everybody's got to yeah. be using the same tooling and seeing what everybody else is doing. Absolutely. Um, so what does all this look like? Obviously we saw really, really quickly. Um, hopefully everybody's going to have the opportunity to, to actually demo this, which we'll talk about. Um, but in this example, we're using GitHub for our um, version control platform of choice. This could be whatever you would like. Um, again, we're just using GitHub. Uh, we're using Ansible for basically most things, right? Ansible playbooks to generate configs from templates. We're using Ansible playbooks to actually do the validation um, and to do the deployment. And that happens to be using Ansible Napalm, which I'm a big fan of. Um, we're using Jenkins, and really we're not using Jenkins for a ton. We're using it kind of for glue to stitch things together. Run this script. If the result is non-zero, meaning something bad happened, then do this. Otherwise, keep going on. So, so that's really all we're using it for. Um, this could take a bunch of different forms, um, obviously, but that's what we're doing. So what are ways that we can uh, kind of improve this and add on to this? Uh, external integration, so I mentioned briefly, uh, we could connect to something like a netbox, which is open source IPAM, um, you know, based on Python. So that's cool. We could use that as maybe a dynamic inventory source, or we could validate the, you know, a user added an IP address in some variable file. Hey, is that IP address in use? Netbox, let me know. Oh, it's not great. Good. Oh, maybe part of this process should be if it's not in Netbox, we should add it to Netbox so that we know it's in use. Um, we might also want to add it to like Libra NMS for monitoring, stuff like that. So there's a lot of ways that we could kind of hook to things external to, to this. We could use something cool like Todd testing on demand distributed um, to actually build our holistic kind of network tests and query Todd every time um, we run a build to make sure that all of our test suites are working as we, as we would think or hope. Um, really a lot of stuff there. One other thing to kind of consider about all of this is just declarative versus imperative, um, which is a big topic that we don't necessarily have time for, but just something to think about. Um, and the reason that we're using config replace in this example is to eliminate that config drift thing. Um, so we're trying to be somewhat declarative, even though we're um, not quite there, I guess I would say, um, but it's much more declarative than a very imperative playbook that says, Interface blah, configure blah, interface blah, configure you know, description. Um, so that's an entire other topic. Uh, something we didn't talk about at all is kind of session state, and that kind of goes into the whole NetConf conversation as well. Um, but the net net is there's really just an unlimited amount of kind of upside to this. So you can kind of you know experiment and see what works. And then just real briefly before any questions, if you want to allow this yourself, um, all of this is in that GitHub repository. You the the readme is relatively um, verbose so basically install virtual box and vagrant um, you can get the boxes from the vagrant box repository um, it's under my name there's links and stuff like that um, once you get it you can vagrant up and basically vagrant will fire up the nxos box the veos box and the jenkins box um, i'm running this all on my macbook 16 gigs of memory and it gets a little dicey 
um, but it should work for most people. So hopefully it's pretty accessible. Um, and then you can fork the repo um, and do whatever you want with it. Um, connect to Jenkins. Jenkins is already kind of set up initial config for you. All you got to do is log in and point it to your repository and you can click build and in the base boxes have nothing really but a management IP address and bigger SSH keys and stuff like that. Um, and, and then, so if you basically point to the repo, click build, you'll be configured. Um, some really basic stuff, just like two routed links, OSPF, BGP, whatever. Um, and then you can go ahead and start adding, you know, tests or, or add things to the variable files so that you can actually start configuring more stuff like that um, and just kind of see what's going on with all of this. So that was that was kind of the intent is to make this, you know, accessible. So, so that's Carl, it. we've got one, one cynical question uh, here <laughs> from Krunal that I think is really worth asking. How much time do we save with the CICD process? I'm assuming it's going to increase as now we add another layer of testing, which we may or may not need, depending on the scope of the change. And I thought the big idea with network automation was to reduce time for changes applied to the network. Um, good question. I, I mean, I think clearly there's a huge amount of time up front to to do this it, so if that's you know something you're interested in then obviously that's going to be a um a big sink um i think if you can get to a place where you're doing this holistically um you can there's a lot of gains to be had right and i i think ultimately the the real value in it for me is that you're building this test suite so that every time you you trigger a build you test everything holistically so certainly if you just want to change a description this is maybe over it's definitely overkill to start right but if you've if you've established this and you're running all of your changes through this then there's a lot of gains to be had from there it's not this is definitely not for everybody for sure this is more of a thought exercise than mm -hmm. you got to make point. it right make a decision of the value and the investment up front to uh, to get the ultimate benefit out of it like yeah. like anything in automation and one yeah. more question yeah, two switches right. it's whatever we're eating into our break time, but I think that's okay. One more good question from Andre. Uh, the whole CICD thing relies on the availability of virtual equivalents of whatever you're running in your network. So how do you interconnect all those virtual network nodes? So for example, let's say switch one gets stood up on hypervisor one, but switch two gets stood up on hypervisor two. Now you've got to have a, a, a P2P link between the two. How do you How do you sort through all of that? Yeah, from a testing perspective, that's fair. I, I mean, I, you can for sure do this against real gear. Um, it doesn't have to be virtual stuff. From a, from a lab perspective, yeah, um, it, it's a hard problem. And obviously, this example is just my laptop fans are spinning up, and so whatever, and it's easy. Uh, viral is totally an option. If you're a really Cisco shop, you can fire up a bunch of stuff in Viral. Um, unit Lab, GNS3, certainly you can do all of that. Um, you could definitely wrap up part of your process to have just a bunch of layer two dumb V switches you know, or port groups in a V switch. So you can plumb things up so they're connected in, in whatever way you want. And that could be part of your, your build environment as well. So that every time you trigger a build, um, you know, maybe it's against branch A um, and there's a topology file that says branch A looks like this and is connected in such and such way with such and such devices that all those VMs get fired up and plumbed together using, you know, whatever the next available VLAN is in a V switch. Um, so, I guess if you want to do it in a lab, that's there's a, you got to skin that cat too. But you could totally yep. do this against you know real kit. And uh, Graham makes one final point that I'd like to get your thoughts on, Carl. Uh, once you do set up the CI/CD environment, you're really committed to it. You need to run all your changes through it for it to be truly effective for your environment, correct? So the, one of the cool things, I think that the short answer is yeah. Um, but I think if you use config replace, which is hard and not always super easy depending on the vendor like the nxos box is super picky about config replace but the cool thing about config replace is we're wholesale replacing config so you could stick this on a cron tab and every half an hour you know your configs go out and get replaced um so if you had you know some kind of somebody being a cowboy running and configuring things not through this you could easily um enforce the desired state with this um hopefully that makes sense but yeah the net net is you would probably want to use this holistically 